take a moment and pray with me? Most gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and the actions we take, O Lord, be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I found an interesting blog this week written by a pastor who's been in ministry for over 30 years. And he wrote it because of a conversation he'd had with someone in his church who said he must have a really easy job after 30 years. He built up a bunch of sermons and had them all filed away by Scripture and Nate Shirley. And he then probably had a lot of Bible studies in his records as well. So he didn't have to do any preparation, right? He just got to come to church, sit in the office, meet with people, do the hospital visits, and then he could just pull out an old sermon whenever he felt like it. Based on that conversation, the Reverend Dr. Steve, or Stephen Montgomery, decided to share a reflection on the Isaiah 11 text that we read this morning and his experience with scripture and how it's changed his life, especially through ministry. I want to share that with you all today. He said this, one would think that the older I get, the more sermons and Bible studies that I have under my belt. That the more routine, the more been there, done that response I might have to reading some of the old texts year in and year out. But I have found that the opposite has happened. As I have gotten older especially, there are certain biblical texts that I can hardly read without weeping. This passage from Isaiah 11 is one of them. One would think that every Advent I would read it and realize we're still so far away from Isaiah's vision. That they're just words. But my response, he says, is getting worse. It seems and not better. And I think I know why. The longer I live and the longer I am in ministry, the more deeply this particular promise of God touches me. And I think it is because I see in so many lives and in my own life how overwhelming it is to have this vision, this real sense of shalom. Life is tough, he says, and even though many of us live what would be called privileged lives, we still have to go through <coughs> tough patches. Those times when we're sure our lives as we know it are going to end for all intents and purposes. And sometimes we experience those terrible blows, the loss of someone we love, the ending of an important relationship, and a sudden pink slip, a deep betrayal, or a loved one's diagnosis of, you name it, things like cancer, Alzheimer's, or ALS. Eventually we make it through unless we're one of the ones who's received a life-threatening illness or injury. But for a time, for most of us, life seems impossible. The joy is gone. The relationships that we've treasured are over. The loved one is missed even more now that they've left. The way of life that we enjoyed is gone. The sense of purpose that we experienced once has disappeared. And sometimes it happens all at once. And after over 30 years of ministry, as a pastor in local churches, Stephen says that he knows that there are things he will never know about people that sit in the pews. Things that they will hold on to so deep in their hearts they will carry sorrows and burdens that no one else will know about. That they will have been born in silence, stay in their hearts, and all he can do is offer his prayer for those things. And he's had those things too, he says. But for him, the long dark nights of Advent... Those hidden things and bad experiences are times for us to be reminded that the prophet's words about God's ultimate purpose is meant for us today. And that those words have something that helps us to see that manifestation so deep in our souls. Just listen to Isaiah's words again. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon the one who is to come, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. The wolf will live with the lamb, 
The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and a little child will lead them. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain, where the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. I don't know if you're familiar with history for the book of Isaiah, but if you're not, then let me share with you that these words written by Isaiah were not spoken in a time of reverie when the beauty of the mountain brooks and the serenity of the quiet pasture lands made the prophet aware of what it was all around him. He was not watching some dazzling sunset. He was watching the dazzling swords of the great and overpowering Assyrian army as they came through his native land of Palestine, leaving nothing, nothing but a trail of blood and agony. He was living through what has been called the first Jewish Holocaust. It occurred over 40 years, between 740 and 700 BCD. Five times during those 40 years, the Assyrian army, that vast and superior Assyria, Assyrian army, came, stampeding through the hill country of Israel, working terror and destruction wherever it may have gone. They did it with no regard for anyone's culture. No regard for anyone's religion or for anyone else's life. It came, what Dr. Stephen says, is like a scorpion plague, devouring everything in its path over and over and over. The people of Isaiah's Judah had been ravaged. The horrid sounds of war were familiar to them. They knew nothing else. The cries of pain very rarely ceased. Who then could plant a field and have any hope that it would survive? Who among them would be willing to bear a child with confidence that it could reach maturity? It was a horrible 40 years. But yet, in the midst of that nightmare and destruction, the prophet spoke. Even though the world had become what he would argue today is a living nightmare, even though there was no sign that peace would ever come, even though human greed and destructiveness were running rampant across the world, Isaiah said to his people, the promise of God is more powerful than the destructiveness of humanity. And Isaiah was pretty bold, and I think he said that more than once, sort of, right? The promise of God is more powerful than the destructiveness of humanity. And he says it in his scripture passages like this, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the child. But there's a lot of distance between Isaiah and what his community lived through in us today. So we only can sometimes look back and wonder what it was like. But we also have to remember that we've been given prophets for our day and time. And I think this week we lost perhaps one of our greatest prophets. One who is brave enough to speak out in the midst of living through a nightmare. Amen. Bishop William Boyd Grove reminds us there's no such thing in this world as a coincidence. When things happen that we're tempted to call a coincidence, he said we should pause and ask ourselves a question. Where is God at work in this situation? And he says, truth be told, at the end of that questioning and reflection, you will probably see that it is more or less a godsidence, God at work in the world. And I think it is a godsidence that Nelson Mandela died in the week of Advent that we focus on peace. When we read Isaiah's text about Israel living in a nightmare, Mandela spoke out in a time that was risky to speak out. His decision to be on the side of justice and speaking publicly against apartheid, sent him to prison for 27 years. And while in prison, he could have become bitter about the conditions he found himself in and the way the prisoners were treated. He could have allowed his anger to fester like a sore over missing out on all the years, watching his children grow up, and seeing the birth of his first grandchild and missing those first milestones. Instead, he found joy in the circumstances and held on to hope. And when he was finally released from prison and later elected president, he could have sought retaliation 
against all of those who held him captive, who stole approximately a third of his life. Instead, he chose the way of peace, the way of reconciliation. He sought ways to teach others about peace, and I think taught it best by the way he lived his life. Mandela once said, if you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy. Then he becomes your partner. Then a little later he would go on to say that I have walked that long road to freedom. I have tried not to falter. I have made missteps along the way, but I have discovered the secret after climbing a great hill. One only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I have taken a moment here to rest, to seal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come, but I can only rest for a moment, for, the free, for freedom comes with responsibility, and I dare not linger, for my long walk is not ended. Well, Mandela's long walk may have ended this week, but we still have a journey ahead to go. We have the journey of Advent to complete. And when we get to Christmas, then we know it's just a hilltop where we can stop and steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds us. But we can't get comfortable because as Mandela reminded us, we still have more hills to climb and a walk that has yet to end. And I think that is what John the Baptist was sent to remind us of too. See, many people thought they had arrived when John the Baptist was around baptizing them and preaching. He even recognized it in the people and said to them, Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. John the Baptist then continued on to urge them to bear fruit worthy of repentance. I think the heart of what John was saying is that we have been given the law and a tradition to follow, and that Jesus has come to show us the way, and that we'll have prophets like Isaiah was for his day or Nelson Mandela is for us today to help us see the light and continue to follow in that path. And our response isn't to be one that's comfortable to sit on top of the hilltop and just relax. It's to be a response that continues to move us forward, one that is filled with peace, with justice, hope, love, and joy. It is to be a response that does not show retaliation. It is to be one that offers light even in the midst of the darkest of days. It is one that takes on head first the Christian path of discipleship. It's not an easy task. It hasn't ever really been, and probably won't be in the coming day with the way our world is now. But the good news is that there is a shoot that came out of a stump, a branch out of its roots, and a promise for us to live by. Amen. Amen.